Okay, hello and welcome. Uh, thank you for coming. So we both work on the Fuchsia team at Google, and today we'll be talking about our experience using Clang's source-based source code coverage. Uh, in Fuchsia, we encourage testing because we think it's a good thing to do. Uh, but simply writing tests is just not enough. Uh, you want to make sure that your tests comprehensively cover your code base. And code coverage is a good metric to, to see how well your tests are doing. That's why in Fuchsia, we've uh, integrated code coverage into our infrastructure. So in our, in our uh, code review tool, whenever a developer uploads a patch, we run tests, we collect coverage, and then we render this coverage directly uh, in, the, in the code review tool, which is Garrett in our case, so that both the author of the patch as well as uh, the reviewer sees how well uh, those tests are covering uh, the implementation. And we also do the same after the change lands. So uh, in post-submit, we also run all tests, we call it coverage, and then in the code browser tool, we also render this coverage uh, so anybody who is browsing the code and see how well the, test, how well the code is covered. Uh, and because we use Clang as our tool chain, uh, it, was, uh, it was a no-brainer uh, that we should be using Clang service-based code coverage. Now, if you're not familiar with Clang service-based code coverage, uh, it reuses the existing profiling instrumentation uh, and combines this with additional uh, metadata that is generated uh, by a front-end pass. Uh, it uses metadata that's derived from AST and from preprocessor, and it provides a uh, very uh, very accurate, uh, sublime, sublime uh, region coverage, uh, uh, but it has significant performance overhead. Uh, to visualize how, how Clang service code coverage works, uh, I can give you a quick example. So let's say we have a simple source file. Uh, so the first thing we have to do is we have to compile it, and to use coverage, we have to use two additional flags. It's the F profile instrument generate, which enables the front end instrumentation, and then F coverage mapping to generate the coverage mapping. Once we have the binary, we can run it. It generates a what we call a raw profile. We can then take this raw profile. Uh, we have to uh, index it. This generates uh, the index profile, which we can then feed into the LVM cough tool, and LVM cough tool can then generate. Uh, different types of information. It can generate an HTML, it can provide a textual output directly in your terminal. Uh, it can also export the JSON uh, information uh, that you can use in other systems. And this is what you actually use in both the pre-submit tool and the post-submit tool. Now, if, if this is what you use, and this is what you would typically see in the example we have in the documentation, it's all fine. Uh, the problem is if uh, if you have more than one source file, more than one binary, if you really start using this at scale. And that's what we have in Fuchsia. Uh, so just to give you a sense of what we are dealing with, uh, I've actually got some statistics. We have about 14,000 sources which produce, from which we produce about 5,000 binaries, of which 4,500 are tests. When we run all these tests, uh, we produce about 7,000 raw profiles, which total to about 36 gigabytes. And then when we index all those profiles, we generate a single sparsified uh, profile, which is one gigabyte. And at this scale, we've actually started seeing some issues. Uh, and so in the rest of the talk, we'll talk about how we've dealt with those issues, how we have addressed those by improving Clang-based source coverage. Um, so the first thing we've noticed after running uh, at this scale is that sometimes we're actually missing profiles. And the problem is that by default, uh, the profile runtime uses an ad exit hook to write the data out. But ad exit hooks are not always invoked. For example, if your process terminates abnormally, either because um, it may crash, uh, it may be terminated by another process, um, or if you have something like a death test, uh, these ad exit hooks will not be, not be invoked. Uh, here's a little example that demonstrates this issue. We have a tiny program. Uh, and if invoked with an argument, it will abort, in which case the generated profile is going to be empty and you're not going to get any counters. So the way, uh, the way coverage works normally is for every basic block or most basic blocks, uh, there is, uh, we have an index uh, and we use this index to index into the uh, counter array. 
we get the counter, we increment it, we write it back. And then we are finished executing, we take all these, uh, we take both the counters and additional metadata sections and write it down into this raw profile. Now the problem is, if the pro uh, program terminates abnormally, this is not gonna happen. So the way we've addressed this is through a level of indirection. What we do, or what we've done is we've introduced uh, this new um, special variable, which is called the LVM profile counter bias, which is a, an offset or displacement that allows you to relocate uh, the location of counters. Uh, initially, it's zero, so the program behaves just as before, there's no difference. Now, at, at any given point, we can write all those profiles to disk. Uh, in our case, we do it immediately after startup. But then we mmap those profiles back into memory, and we update the counter bias uh, to, a, to a delta between the original location and the new location. So from now on, every counter update is actually gonna be updated, this mmap uh, version of the profile, uh, and it's gonna happen for the whole duration of the program. So if the program terminates, we are gonna get an accurate, uh, accurate counters. Um, and so here's an example, the same code, but if we enable the runtime counter relocation, which is currently done through a backend option, uh, we are gonna get the correct, correct counters. So in Fuchsia, we actually use this by default. Uh, you don't have to specify any flags. Uh, and it's been working great. We no longer have any issues. We haven't been missing any, uh, any counters. Unfortunately, uh, it does introduce additional overhead, uh, both at the instrumentation level, uh, like it increases the binary size and it also makes uh, the program a little bit small, slower because there's that extra level of indirection. And so we started thinking about how can we, how can we mitigate some of this by, by optimizing the instrumentation. And we came up with a couple of different ways. Uh, first of all, when we started looking at the binary size, we actually noticed that there's a lot of dead code in instrumented binaries. And upon further examination, we found out that the, the GC sections uh, flag that we use uh, to delete or garbage collect unused, uh, unused sections from our binaries doesn't work uh, when we use uh, the coverage instrumentation. Uh, the reason for that is in the binary, when you compile your code, uh, the compiler generates some of these additional, additional sections for things like counters, and metadata and names. And these sections, they have cross-references between the original section that contains uh, the code for, for the function um, and back. And these references basically prevent linker from identifying this function as that. So even though here we have a function that's unused, the function B, linker won't be able to garbage collect it. Uh, the way we've addressed this is we've extended the notion of uh, section groups in ELF. We've introduced something called the zero flag section groups, and we place all of these, all these metadata into separate section groups which are associated with the original, original section. And we've also updated Linker, and now Linker can see, uh, and it can see that these metadata sections belong to the original, original, function, original section, it belongs to the function, and it can garbage collect it uh, as, as, as we want. Uh, so in our case, uh, this really helped. Uh, we've actually seen reduction in the binary size as well as profile size about 50%. Um, to actually implement this at the IR level, we had to introduce a new com that selection type into LVM IR. It's called the no, uh, no to duplicate. Um, we also had to figure out how to lower this uh, both in LVM and then properly handle it at the LD level. Uh, but this is now uh, enabled by default. If you use GC sections and if you use ELF, uh, there is no special flag you need uh, to get this behavior. Uh, the other improvement is that we've actually noticed in pre-submit testing that when you have patches, uh, they only touch small portion of your code base. Very often, like a patch uh, can touch a handful of functions. Uh, but by default, we will always instrument the whole code base introducing a lot of unnecessary overhead. And so to reduce this overhead, what if we could just instrument code that actually changed and not instrument code that has stayed the same as before? And so that's what we did. We actually introduced at the LVM IR level new attributes that can be placed on functions uh, to tell the backend to avoid instrumenting those. It's the no profile and skip profile. And we want also introduce a new way to tell the compiler to avoid instrumenting either entire files or, or certain functions. 
We've actually reused the existing format is the sanitizer special case list format. Uh, so here's an example of, of how you would uh, write such a file. Uh, it has all the different options. We have a complete documentation if you want to learn more about it. But you can write um, such, a, such a file, feed it into Clang, and then Clang will use it to determine uh, which portions of your source files to instrument or not. Um, now, at this point, I'm going to hand it over uh, to GoFam. We will tell you a little bit more about how we've integrated all of this into our infrastructure. Uh, OK, thanks, Peter. Uh, so next, I'm going to talk about the coverage pipeline in Fuchsia and the issues that we encountered in this pipeline and our solutions to those issues. So uh, we use different machines for building our tasks, running our, uh, building our project, running our tasks, and post-processing coverage. We always strip our binaries to reduce their size and upload the unstripped binaries into a symbol server uh, so that we can fetch them on demand for various reasons. Uh, for coverage post-processing, we need to use uh, unstripped binaries, which include the necessary coverage information. Uh, for this problem, I mean, the first problem that we were having, we needed a way to associate the collected profiles with the unstripped binaries during post-processing. So all the things that I'm going to talk today is going to be about Fuchsia coverage pipeline. In 2021, uh, Peter gave a keynote uh, where he talked about, the, you know, where he gave an overview of Fuchsia, how, you know, we use LLVM to build Fuchsia and so on. Today, I'm going to specifically talk about the issues that impact, you know, Fuchsia coverage. So um, this diagram visualizes uh, the coverage pipeline. Uh, we have our source files. We compile them with coverage instrumentation enabled, and we generate our binaries. We then strip our binaries and upload the unstripped binaries into a symbol server. And we run the strip binaries on multiple machines with generate profiles. Uh, and you know, after we finish executing all the binaries, we have so many profiles, and we collect all these profiles from various machines, and we do some post-processing. And during post-processing, we need to provide the unstripped binaries to the LLVM code to be able to generate the coverage report. After we finish executing, we have all these profiles, but we don't know, you know what profile corresponds to what binary. So uh, what we were doing was we were relying on a log-based approach where we emit the association between a profile and the binary during runtime. This was causing reliability and performance issues in our system. So we came up with a solution in LLVM, which is embedding binary IDs into profiles. Uh, what is binary ID? It refers to the unique identifier uh, for binaries in different file formats. Uh, for example, we have the build ID, which is a unique identifier in the ELF file format. ELF is the file format that we are interested in, but there are similar identifiers used in other file formats, such as MACO and COF, to the best of my knowledge. So the idea is that if we can embed the binary ID into the profile itself, later on we can use it to map the profile back to the binary. And in order to support that, uh, we added the you know, uh, binary ID support into coverage. Uh, we added the ELF build ID support into coverage, but we wanted to give it a generic name, and we called it binary ID so that it can be, you know, other, other file formats can, use our, uh, can reuse our implementation. Um, we added the support into profile, profile runtime to be able to read and write binary IDs. And we added the support into LLVM prof data to be able to display the binary IDs. And on the right hand side, I'm showing you a simple example. So when you compile your source file with build ID and coverage instrumentation flags, uh, you generate your binary. And when you run that binary, you get a profile. And if you invoke the LLVM prof data with show binary IDs option, you should be able to see the binary ID uh, for that uh, profile. So what does you know, our coverage pipeline look like after we started using embedded binary IDs in profiles? So everything is the same up to the point where we generate the raw profiles. 
And after we generate the raw profiles, we invoke the LLVM prof data show binary IDs option on every raw profile to find the binary ID and use that binary ID to fetch the unstripped binary from the symbol server and feed it to LLVM call. Um, so what are the benefits of using binary ID? Uh, we have seen multiple you know, benefits. Uh, it simplified our coverage pipeline, it increased our reliability, uh, and it reduced our coverage post-processing time by 25%. Okay, this is great, but you know what's next, right? Um, so this brings me to the second topic that I want to talk today, which is adding debug info D support into coverage. Uh, what's debug info D? Debug info D is a simple HTTP API that can be used to fetch unstripped binaries by their build ID. So the way it works is that you upload your unstripped binaries into a public debug info D server. And later on, you query as an unstripped binary by providing a build ID. Our team has done a lot of work you know, for integrating debug info D into LLVM call, into LLVM, uh, for example. Uh, we already uh, support uh, debug info D in LLVM symbolize and LLVM opt dump. And what we were trying to do with coverage was we were trying to integrate debug info D into the LLVM call tool itself. So what is the motivation of adding debug info D into coverage? Uh, you know, uh, the main motivation is that we do not need to, prof we do not need to provide unstripped binaries to LLVM call if we have the debug info D support in LLVM call. So all the work that I was, I described you before, you know, like reading the binary ID and uh, reading the binary ID, finding the associated binary and fetching from the symbol server all this can be integrated into LLVM call tool itself, and LLVM call can do all this work under the hood. Um, so we rolled this out into Fuchsia. Uh, 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 sorry, yeah, we added the. So we went through two steps to be able to support debug info D in coverage. So in the first step, we uh, we added the sub, uh, binary ID support into the index profiles. Uh, previously, we were only doing it for the raw profiles. And as a second step, we added the debug info D support into LLVM call to be able to fetch the binaries uh, from the debug info D server. Uh, yeah, we rolled this out into Fuchsia. It you know, further simplified our coverage infrastructure. Okay, this brings me to the last topic that I'm, uh, I'm going to talk today, which is uh, using per directory indexes in coverage reports. Uh, so Peter and I commented you how in the Google Summer uh, Code program this summer uh, with the LLVM organization, and the goal of this project was to improve the readability of coverage reports by enhancing LLVM code. So, LLVM code generates a single top level uh, HTML, uh, single top level HTML index for the entire project. And this causes rendering scalability issues for large projects such as Fuchsia. On the right hand side, I'm showing you a, a very small subset of our HTML report that we generate uh, for our entire code base. And this HTML report has around 14,000 rows, which makes it very difficult to, to load the page. To solve this problem, you have implemented per directory uh, indexes in, in coverage reports, which can be enabled by using a show directory coverage option in LLVM call. So now on the right hand side, I'm showing you the per directory coverage for the uh, Fuchsia code base. Now you are seeing the coverage only at the top level directories. And if you go into every directory, you can see the coverage for its subdirectories and files. Uh, we also enabled this feature in the LLVM coverage bot. In case you didn't know, uh, we have a coverage bot in LLVM that collects the coverage for the LLVM code base. Uh, if you go to you know, LLVM.org and click LLVM code, you should be able to find the link uh, to the HTML report that we generate for the, uh, for the LLVM project. So at the bottom, you can see the 
a coverage report, a per directory coverage report generated for the LLVM project. So here, here you are seeing uh, the accumulated coverage for Clang, LLDB, and LLVM. And if you click on it, you know you can see, uh, you know you can see the coverage uh, on its subfiles. Um, yeah, this is the end of our talk. Uh, before we move to the Q and A section, I want to highlight something here. Uh, we have a lot of ideas for coverage, and we are just listing some of the ideas here. In case you have, you know, you are interested in any of these ideas, or if you have your own ideas to improve coverage, we'll be very interested in collaborating with you. Yeah, thank you so much for listening. Questions? Uh, why do you do the bias rather than like rewriting a variable? Like for the independent uh, perf data, why didn't you have like a variable that you then rewrite? Why do you like make it an addition just out of interest? You have like your original buffer and then you kind of calculate the offset to your new buffer. Why can't you rewrite the reference to the buffer? Uh, well, if I understand the question correctly, like if we rewrite it, the original friends, like we would have to do it for every uh, for every counter update, right? Like we would end up with the we would end up with the relocation oh. for every counter update, and there's going to be thousands or potentially millions of so those. The, yeah. The so the same bias is used for the entire for the entire binary image. Okay. So the, the system that you showed about build IDs that work for a executable, if you're building a full-fledged executable, right? So if the executable depends on multiple shared libraries with each build ID of its own, then uh, uh, how do you plan to support that? Uh, it works for, so every binary has its own build ID. So every executable, each executable, each shared library is gonna have its own build ID. Okay. And we're going to get one profile for each binary, whether it's executable or shell library. But isn't the coverage coverage one for the whole entire executable? No? The coverage, the the raw coverage that you get from running the executable is basically, does it record the build IDs for all the dependencies and the and the executable as well? Uh, no, we generate we generate a, a single profile per per binary that's loaded in the in the address space. So if you have if you have say a, a executable that uses three shared libraries, we're going to generate four profiles, one per binary, one for each shared library. Yeah. Oh, okay, and then you merge it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. So right now, right now on the uh, LVM Cof page on the. Um, what's not, they only have um, LVM, Clang, and LDB. Is there any process to add extra other project into that? I think there was an interest from the other sub-projects, like Poly or something. Uh, but, uh, you know, at this point, we only collect coverage for, for these three. Okay. But we can, we can extend it, you know, if there is an interest from the other sub-projects. Thanks. For the zero flag changes to LLD, do you remember which version of LVM that went into by any chance? Zero flags? I'm sorry. Uh, the zero flag session groups. Uh, oh, session. I would need to take a look. I can get back to you later. Um, my, it was probably two, three years ago, so oh, okay. my guess would be LVM 14, 15, uh, but I can double check. All right, thanks. Okay, any more questions? All right, thank you, Goldfam and Peter, very much. We'll start our next talk in five minutes. <laughs>